There's something for every sports fan on CBSLocalSports.com. Watch live radio shows and original video programming while reading national articles from some of the best writers in the country. Visit CBSLocalSports.com today. Sports podcasts on Play.it are brought to you by DraftKings, a leading provider of daily fantasy sports. A man who wears the 10 pounds of gold, the nature boy, Ric Flair. You know, I was like to take this opportunity to talk about myself. The 16-time heavyweight champion has arrived. I've got the style and profile like never before. The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic once again. You're talking to the Rolex-wearing, diamond-ring-wearing, gift-stealing, wheeling-dealing, limousine-like, jet-flying, son of a gun. Woo! This is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. I'm the man. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ric Flair, 16 times your world champion in the host of Woo Nation. And I'm with my good friend Conrad Thompson, and our guest today is my good friend, and not even arguably, but probably the greatest TV announcer personality in the history of pro wrestling, Mean Gene. Mean by God, Gene Oakland. Woo! Woo! I hear ya. How are you, buddy? How you doing? I'm doing great, Rick. Doing great. You know, I travel around and people always go, you know, who is the best wrestler? Who who are the top three or who are the top four? And I, you know, I've answered that a thousand times, but there's only been three people I've ever known in this business that captivated an audience from your end of it as well as you do, and that would be yourself, Gordon Soley, and Jim Ross. That's yeah, and, not uh, a shot and there was another else, guy he, in the old days up uh, up in Minneapolis, Rick, uh, from uh, from where you uh, kind of kicked everything off by the name of Marty O'Neill, a great Irishman who wouldn't step back from a cocktail, by the way. So <laughs> we, we, we did have something in common. But uh, he'd walk to the bar up the hill on Randolph Street over in St. Paul, <laughs> And then when he went home, he'd whack, uh, walk back up the hill, much like the Crusher. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I assure you that Gordon Soley didn't miss a cocktail over no, there. No, and, and another <laughs> Minneapolis guy. <laughs> yeah. Gordon Soley got two million miles on Delta flying from Tampa to Atlanta. <laughs> we, we, we got the two million mile award the same day. <laughs> now, on the way back, he would have at least... Ten vodkas in an hour Absolutely, and a half. Absolutely, yeah. And I had to wrestle. That was, how are you getting home, Gordon? Oh, I got a ride. Going to Malio's. <laughs> yep. I'm going to stop, stop after this for uh, a couple of uh, pit stops before I go home. <laughs> well, Gene, I mean, you know, here's the deal. When I first started in 1972, I got an invite. Um, I can't remember if it came from Gene directly or Vern Gagne, but he invited me over to Gene's house. The first time I really got to socialize with Gene, aside from at the station, WTCN, of course. And uh, that's the first time I met and really got to talk to Mean Gene. And the first time I had a drink with him. <laughs> and well, 43 probably years in later, the days when I was on uh, KDWB and WDGY playing that top 40 rock and roll music, that garbage, <laughs> you probably were listening to me then. Yeah, I probably was, but I didn't know who you were then. <laughs> well, that wouldn't make a difference. And I actually, since my parents put me in boarding school, I wasn't in town that often in my youth. <laughs> Is that what they're calling it now, boarding <laughs> yeah, school? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was either they had... <laughs> what was the place at Forest Lake, the, the, the children's place where they wanted to put me a couple of times that I got out of? Um, that was that, that was called the Reform School. Yeah, Glen Lake. Glen Lake, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I, got, I got to the entrance a couple of times, but... <laughs> You know, I you got out of that name, Vern Gagne, uh, Rick and Conrad. Uh, I, I did the eulogy last week at Vern's funeral in suburban Minneapolis, out in Eden Prairie, full house, by the way. And uh, your name was brought up often and uh, very, very prominently by the wrestling community. I saw Larry Hennig. I saw Brad Ringens, uh, Jim Brunzel, Greg Gagne. 
Uh, even Evan Johnson showed up there. But, I mean, there was a, a ton of wrestling people there and all spoke of your career and even took credit for a lot of it getting started in the Twin Cities area. Well, And, and I think that's true. It's totally true. If it hadn't been for Vern Gagne and Greg Gagne, actually starting with Greg, but if it hadn't been for Vern, you know, uh, making me see it through, because, you know, I quit three times. Um, oh, oh, yes. I didn't, I planned on going, going out there and being like the crusher. I didn't know I had to run two miles and do 500 free squats and 250 push-ups at 300 pounds. I hadn't run a mile in five years, much less two at 300 pounds. And well, as I tell everybody, the only guy that made me look good was Ken Patera because he weighed 330. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. But boy, what a I, I will say this. Uh, at the visitation on Monday, funeral being on Tuesday, uh, I got a chance to chat with uh, Bud Grant, the great Bud Grant, okay. longtime coach of the Minnesota Vikings, and a great athlete in his own right, Rick, as yes. you know. yes. Uh, he was he was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, I think the Minneapolis Lakers at that time. So, I mean, he was an all-around athlete. But he told me, he said, the greatest athlete that I have ever seen in my life is Vern Gagne. Wow. Yeah, he was phenomenal. I've, I've heard that, too. I mean, you know, it, it's different. It's funny how we measure different athletes now. Um or how you measure someone's all-around athletic skills, but... Um, well, I mean, it's not Brutus or Barber Beefcake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's right. <laughs> uh, you took the word right out of my mouth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm saying, but Vern was just... Uh, and, you know, one thing about Vern, too, people didn't understand, is Vern was tough. Every time we went to Vern... You know what, Rick? 99 out of 100 guys back in the locker room... He could knock on their ass. Exactly. I mean, the only guy I ever saw give him any slack verbally was Mad Dog. And Mad Dog was really tough. <laughs> well, he yeah. might take you out the hard way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Another guy that jumped him was uh, Dr. David Schultz, and uh, Vern put him down right away. Schultz so. jumped Vern Gagne? I didn't know that. Yes. That happened in the television studio. Uh when we were doing interviews one afternoon. Really? See, I, I didn't know that. And uh, I knew Schultz a little bit, but I never saw that. You know, I heard tough, he was like a kid. I thought tough. he stuck to John Stossel. Yeah, yeah well, he, <laughs> did, he did that, too. Yeah. And I was about 10 feet away from that one. Yeah, Jesus. Well, yeah, Vern was really tough and uh, a, a perfectionist. And, uh, you know, uh, I tell everybody... <laughs> I, I love the Christmas parties that we all went to, but at 12 o'clock at night, Vern wanted to wrestle everybody. Oh, yeah. Just the way it was. Or and sing, I, and I tried or to get out of there. My cheating heart. Yeah, I, tr I, I tried to get out of there by 1130. <laughs> I just knew it was coming, you know. Jesus, he wanted to wrestle everybody. Yeah. Uh, but you know you know what? He, he, he was, uh, for, his, for his time and his place, he was a visionary of sorts. He... He took the, definitely popped the, the business up a notch, and the AWA was one of the most desirous territories in the entire country, as you know. Oh, for uh, sure. And, yeah. and it, it attracted a lot of great talent through the years. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, everybody says, and I, I guess you could, you, you could agree with me or, or say I'm wrong, but I, I think that they'd still be in business, probably like Crockett would be, if they just would have... Well, Crockett tried to be a little uh, more in, 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 what am I looking for, the word innovative. Uh, but Vern was just old school and wouldn't change his ways. And the marketing deals were coming along. And Vince, you know, I think Vince and you know tried to work it out with him. But, you know, eventually all the talent was going. And that's it, and the way our business is. You can't blame the talent for going where the money is. And that, that marketing uh, scheme that Vince put together just, Pretty much closed down everybody, including yep. us. Yeah, that that model was uh, was sensational. But I, I I I really contend it's all due to cable TV. Once we had cable TV, uh, Crockett's operation in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, could be seen all over the country, and uh, so could Burns, and so could uh, Vince Senior's operation out of New York on uh, Madison Square Garden TV. Mm -hmm. So I think once cable uh, proliferated the market in this country, 
And uh, all of the television shows could be seen by everybody. The cat was kind of out of the bag. And that changed the landscape forever, forever. Yeah, I can see the billboard now. I used to drive by it every day uh, going to Techwood. I was cable before cable was cool. Ted Turner, man. Ted Turner. <laughs> yeah. So, and, Gene, uh, what was it like working for Vern? And, and was it hard to leave? How did that come about? Did Vince approach you, or was just the writing on the wall? Or what did that look like at the time? Well, actually, you know, I had a business, a, a marketing firm in uh, Minneapolis with uh, two other gentlemen, and uh, that was going very good. So, actually, Conrad, I was only working, as Rick knows, probably one or two days a week in wrestling. And Vince came up with something. Of course, Pat Patterson was on, on the line with him. Come on, Hogan's coming in. He wants you to come in, and we want you to come in, and here's the, here's the price. Well, I took that back to uh, my friend, Mr. Gagne, who uh, immediately blew up. How could you ever think of leaving me? Well, for a hundred thousand more a year, probably I could think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, as it turned out, uh, I wasn't told to hit the bricks, but they knew what I felt like. And two weeks later, I was in New York or Allentown, Pennsylvania, and uh, doing interviews with Hulk Hogan. So yeah. at that point, had you met Vince before, or was that just the initial time you actually met? Was I, I, I met him. I met him in uh, St. Louis one time when uh, uh, Sam Mushnick was still, as Rick knows, was still the uh, kingpin down in St. Louis, and actually kind of the backbone of the NWA back in those days because St. Louis was a hot market. And, uh, yeah, Vince was in there. He eventually bought that, that promotion out from... Uh, from Sam and others, because there were, I think, four or five different uh, uh, owners in that in that particular club. Yeah, Harley and Bob Geigel and Bill Longson. And I think the late, great Pat O'Connor might even have had a piece yeah, of it. Yeah, Pat, too, right? Yep. Right. But, uh, no, I, and uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I, I kind of got the impression, initially, that Vince might have been operating on a shoestring, which uh, I think he probably was. Uh, but he, he, he certainly made something out of it, and it wasn't long before I was a believer and a big proponent of whatever he was doing. I didn't quite know all the time what was going on either. And, uh, Rick, you know, you were sitting in Charlotte at that time and Atlanta, and uh, probably, what is this guy doing? You know, it's well, not I know. I mean, wrestling. You know. It's more entertainment. Mm -hmm. And they introduced mainstream and the rock and wrestling and Cindy Lauper and all kinds of celebrities. It, it just changed it forever. Yeah, I mean, I certainly wasn't, uh, you know, everybody, all my friends were, you know, <laughs> evacuating the campus. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we still had a lot of talent. And the, the thing that, you know, we prided ourselves on is that, you know, I didn't get it, you know. The Hulk was it's great and he and I joke about it now, but the the match the f the first or the last the first match before intermission five <laughs> five minutes and then gone while I'm out there for sixty minutes every night, eleven o'clock and gone. I wonder why I was drinking at night. God dang. <laughs> well, and, and and I of course had to accompany you on those. Uh, <laughs> no, those no, you were in New York at that time. You were you were you were in the jungle with the bushwhackers. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, but uh, you, you know, or Kabbalah. I, I, I think the I think the definition of uh, of a star in our business changed then, and uh, they didn't necessarily have to be great technicians like yourself. Rick, no, Hulk I know Hogan that, couldn't go for an hour. That's the word in the word. The word gimmick <laughs> really came. Along. A, yeah, well, I mean, it was a lot of right. gimmicks. <laughs> I mean, to me, superstar Billy Graham was a gimmick. Yeah. God, Jesse Ventura was a gimmick. Yeah, but so, there, there was a lot of good workers too, and some of the the, the real purists. I'll even throw Backlund in there, but a lot of the amateur guys, including uh, Chris Taylor, uh, you know, they were. They technically were sound, but they were Greco-Roman. They were yeah. freestyle guys. They weren't 
they weren't entertaining in the ring. Yeah. Ric Flair, uh, up over the top, around the post, and back in the ring, uh, that to me is entertainment. Yeah, well, Gene, you know, it's funny because I was telling someone last week, as my skills declined over the years, my entertainment value picked up. <laughs> and when I, my greatest line from you, of course, I started out by with me and Gene, but the greatest line that you always said to me was, uh-oh, off comes the laundry. <laughs> yeah, right. and, and, and it that, did. <laughs> that, that was in the ring, sometimes in the hotel bar. How about the poem? <laughs> what, what's that? How about the all poem? you had on that uh, yeah. night was a pair of socks. I mean, it was all gone. <laughs> the Palm Restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> oh, I was on a mission to show G in a good time. Oh, boy, and did you... <laughs> you, you kept the ladies uh, very, very entertained <laughs> yeah. there for a good can, 45 minutes. Who can minutes. take off their clothes at the Palm Restaurant in Charlotte and not go to jail? <laughs> right. Yeah. I wanted to show G that was a big deal in town. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, you're, I, I don't want you to start bragging, Rick. No, no, I'm talking about, you know, running around in front of Alejandra. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But I wonder I, how I she's you meant doing big now. deal some other way, and I said, that's not necessary. <laughs> Here's Conrad and myself sitting on the sidelines and hearing something like that emanate from you. <laughs> You and Secretariat had a lot in common. Well, I couldn't find a limousine, but I will promise you this. I did lay Mean Gene down in a cab and send him on his way. Back, back to the hotel, Jones. <laughs> to the hotel, Jones. Right. The Nature Boy is going to take a quick trip on Space Mountain. You better be here when I get back. The wait is finally over. Baseball season is here at last, and the excitement continues all season long at DraftKings.com, the official daily fantasy partner of Major League Baseball. Daily fantasy means no season-long commitments, just instant cash, instant gratification. Why wait until the end of the season to claim victory when you can win huge cash every day? At DraftKings, it's like a brand new season every time you play. Just select two pitchers, eight position players, stay under the salary cap, and you could be on your way to an enormous payday. Last year, Peter from Colorado won a million bucks at DraftKings in one day, just playing fantasy baseball. Hundreds of thousands of fantasy sports fans just like you have already called in at DraftKings. Now it's your turn. Woo! Heard to DraftKings.com now. Use promo code FLAIR to play for free. You could win part of the $300 million in prizes being awarded this season. Use promo code F-L-A-I-R, FLAIR, for free entry now at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com, that's DraftKings.com. Woo! The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic once again. This is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. Mean Gene, of course, is the guest of the hour, and we've been talking a little WWF from the old school days, from the 80s, and Gene, you were there for all the cartoons and rock and wrestling, Hulkamania, action figures, everything in between. Do you remember, as Vince was kind of changing the business with all of these concepts, having an aha moment where you knew this was going to be a huge success? Well, the, the, the aha moment uh, came at WrestleMania 1, when that was a, uh, a qualified success. Uh, that, that, that really took us into the new era officially. And all of the things that kind of led up to that, with uh, the Cindy Lauper, the rock and wrestling connection, uh, MTV with the brawl to settle it all and the war to settle a score, and all of those events. And Madison Square Garden, of course, was popping then. The only thing about 1985, guys, you've got to remember the addressable cable homes for pay-per-view were actually probably around two and a half million, no more. So wow. that event showed on closed circuit TV in the various venues, in uh, uh, geez, even opera halls, but uh, it was high school gymnasiums, National Guard armories, and uh, 
venues like that. But after after cable came in and pay-per-view uh, really started to kick in, that's when the money started to flow. Plus, at that time, Vince was doing 12 or 1,400 house shows a, a year. And they don't do anything like that now. If it's three or 400, even including the European tour, I think that's probably it. Three or 400 now? Yeah, I'd say 400 a year. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's funny because uh, <clears throat> we'd cross paths with the guys from up there and. The, we were all going out for 75, you know, sometimes 80 days at a time. Right. Those guys worked, and I mean, Hulk included, every day on the road. Oh, I mean. Yeah, you know. and, and, and uh, it was probably necessary to build the base for the company. If you take a look at Vince's model with the revenue streams that he developed mm -hmm. that had not been developed by other people before. Uh, merchandise, yes, but there was so many other things. Once we got into licensing and the things of that nature, Rick, uh, this business became a big, big business. I mean, it, it's in the billions today, even though that's not the profit that's taken in or the gross profit taken in by WWE. It is definitely a multi-billion dollar business worldwide. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, gosh, it just... Um... <clears throat> It, it, you've got to be involved at the level that you and I have been for so many years to totally understand it. I, people ask me all the time, is it big in Europe? Is it big in Europe? You've got to be kidding me. You well, it just sold out Budapest two nights in a row. Yeah, you can't buy a ticket in Europe or South America. Right. And, How about and they're Turkey? Going, they're going into um, Tokyo again, and that's already sold out in July. I mean, it's it's incredible. And that's and that's without TV in Tokyo, unless they've gotten it back, Gene. Do they? Well, no, they, they've got uh, they've got satellite TV. They've got uh, Star and in Tokyo. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Well, that, but I yeah, mean, that, that, that comes out of Hong Kong. But I mean, it, it, all, all of these, uh, uh, it, it'd be like a Dish or Direct, uh, only for a television channel. Yeah. And uh, it's all satellite. Yeah, well, and I want to, when we go, when I've, I tell people nobody gets it, they, they do between 22 and $25 a head. Let's say they're charging 200 U.S. for a ringside seat, which is pretty accurate. Right. Then they're doing $25 a head, or approximately $25 a head in merchandise on 18,000 people in every venue. I mean, that, oh, that's. Oh, no, no, they're, they're million dollar houses. Yeah, million dollar gates. Well, then, and that's right. not the merchandise. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. and it's that way every time they go. You know, and every time we get a little soft here or they get soft, they just <laughs> take a dart and throw it where it lands. And, <laughs> you know, they, they make a, they make a, find a venue and they go. And I mean, like, we're going back to Mexico now in October. And I never figured out how they do that because I figured we'd all get killed going down to the first time. But it's not Puerto Rico. Yeah, 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 wow. Puerto Rico. Well, but they go into Mexico, Mexico City, and Monterey for three days, and take out a million bucks a night down there too. I well, never no, figured out how that works. WWE is huge, and uh, I, I, I think their affiliation now is a Univision. Am I correct? The other one would be a Telemundo. Yeah, of uh, the uh, Latin networks, but uh, WWE has got a huge presence, and 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 the company. Uh, in, in, in booking, and Vince as an individual was smart enough to integrate the Lucha Libras into, uh, you know, into his uh, talent roster. And uh, that makes a big difference, not only in this country, because of the huge Latino population, but think of Mexico, and now that we're in Brazil and Argentina, uh, it's a big deal. Yeah. He's doing a lot of things right. Yeah, it's funny because at WCW, they had uh, 40 Latino people, and we never ran Mexico. <laughs> no, <laughs> plus that was overkill. <laughs> we, we would have La Parca. The, the theory was they were, they were there to guard the NWO. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, and and that, that was quite an experience, too, that... Uh, where you and I did see each other on a daily basis. Oh, Gene, every Monday and every Thursday night. Are you kidding me? I oh. I, I, I went down for the money, and I stayed for the money. <laughs> uh, you know, i got to tell you. Uh, it, it was excruciating. Yeah. When I uh, went back, um, 
I got to tell you this story. I almost brought it up earlier, but Brad Siegel, when I go back after my run in the early 90s and you were there, and Brad Siegel goes, God, he says, Rick, how do we get those wrestlers up there to come here? And I said, you got wrestlers here. What you need is Gene Oakland and Bobby Heenan. Right. <laughs> I said, we got the talent, and I get a hold of the announcers. <laughs> so... I put in your resume in Atlanta. You knew that, right? Well, of course you did. <laughs> I had to have someone to suffer with. <laughs> Good Lord. And if I wouldn't have beaten Bill Shaw out of Cherokee uh, Golf Club, <laughs> uh, I don't think I would have got the job. <laughs> At least not for that money. Oh, but God. He, he saw a real pigeon there. Oh, Gene and I have had so much fun. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, guys. I, we have fallen off the same bar stools many nights. <laughs> no. Have, no. Have, have you shared with Conrad the fact that I got up after I'd had a couple of see throughs <laughs> and did a little dance on the bar in Huntsville, Alabama <laughs> at the Hilton? <laughs> and uh, if it weren't for. For you and Iron Anderson, I would have fallen on the floor. <laughs> yeah. which was a long way away. Oh God! You read, a lot of people don't know this story. I'm sure you won't mind me telling it. But Gene, I was hanging out with Gene, and he was getting yellower every day, like scarlet fever. Right? right. Was, he was losing. He was experiencing kidney failure. Okay. It did not back him away from the bar. He said to me one night. He said, "It's either going to work out or it's not." And uh, you got the call, and uh, Nigerian, right? I still remember his name. John Dr. Nigerian. Nigerian, right? And uh, I believe the kidney came out of Cincinnati, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. They don't really share all of that information. I think I was doing some undercover work to find out. <laughs> yeah, but I believe that was a motorcyclist who wrapped his Harley around a telephone pole and uh, was an organ donor. Thank goodness. Yeah, well, they fixed Gene up, and I'll be damned if he wasn't back in action in less than a month, and guess where we were? I, I was back in action in in 10 days, and I met you at the bar saying, <laughs> what are we going to do tomorrow night? <laughs> 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 to, to survive these two-and-a-half or three-hour nitros, oh, Jesus <laughs> yeah, and they, and they were brutal because you wouldn't get a run sheet until you were three quarters of the way through the show. <laughs> so they'd have a, a, a scheduled interview, uh, me with you, or and, and that'd be no problem. But if I got somebody like Buff Bagwell or Lex Luger or Scott Steiner, I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was my interview. <laughs> And I wasn't going to lose control. <laughs> you could take over. <laughs> well, I just was out there to entertain you. <laughs> to prove well, I could he, still I, hold I go back together. and look at some of these. And huh? I've got a friend of mine who's an accountant up in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. But uh, he sends me, forwards me, all of the YouTube interviews <laughs> you that I. we did at WCW <laughs> uh, back in the mid and late 90s. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you stole the show, brother. You really did. <laughs> no, you know, you've we, got, you got to have that magic in the ring, but you got to have it on the mic and in front of the camera. No, we, we stole it. It was, a, it was a mutual arrangement. We didn't have to talk about anything. <laughs> we just went out there. And, and a lot of times, we didn't have a lot to talk about. We just talked to each well, other. Well, anyway, we talked about uh, Space Mountain and uh, uh, the women. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, that, that and, was good, good and being at the Marriott. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, actually, we were good about plugging lady, hotel lady, chains. Leading them to the trough. We could say, ladies, as soon as we're off the air, we'll be down at the Marriott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter what city we were in. <laughs> but no, it's got to be a Marriott in every city. Yeah, it could be the Hilton or the Hyatt, <laughs> the hotel of choice. But we'd change accordingly. <laughs> I never, ever drank a martini in my life. And I'm saying this. I don't know why I just didn't drink martinis. I, I, I guess I hadn't had a chance enough to be that refined in my life. <laughs> but I, <laughs> for three solid years, I started drinking dirty martinis with me and Gene. And I'm not talking about two or three. <laughs> Sometimes Gene and I would be pushing the 12, 13 number. <laughs> They taste oh. good, damn it. They go down easy. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I started out on Pop-Off, moved up to Smirnoff, and now I'm drinking Kettle One, and you're on Grey Goose. 
<laughs> I think he knows a thing or two. Oh yeah. God, Gene and I. See, we're, I, we're, think, I think the business today, Rick, and and you're a little bit closer to it than I am, even though I am still in the employ of uh, WWE, and uh, and grateful because I get a chance to, you know, rub up with the uh, with with the great ones like we did out at WrestleMania. But I, I just I just got a feeling that the business is healthy and that this guy can maintain that. If we can't do it here domestically, let's get it done globally. And that's where, you know, they're bringing in those big bucks. Yeah, well, I think, I think the business is healthy, and I think for the first time in a long time that the roster is healthy. And they have some new guys that uh, bring a lot to the company. Um and you got to freshen up that talent and storylines always. Yeah, I just I wish the kids could have fun though. Like they, you know, it's not the same. And I, I tell them that all the time. I, I, I don't think I don't think like bringing me around because all the kids just want to hear stories about the old days, you know. And God, um, I mean, it, the kids are so scrutinized now, and they they just can't they can't go out and enjoy themselves. It's not because they don't want to. It's just that they're walking here, around on pins and needles, you know? Here, here's, here's my theory on that. They are so afraid of doing something wrong mm -hmm. that they can't do anything right. Yeah, that's that's wow. pretty accurate. Yeah. Because they just, uh, you know, in the old days, I didn't, you know, I tell this story to a lot of people. Gene, you were there, of course. Um, when I uh, retired um in 2008, you know, that whole weekend I was saying, oh, I'm not going to drink, you know, God, I'm just going to be ready for my match with Sean and all this stuff, right? And Michael Hayes looked at me on Saturday and said, what are you doing? I said, I know, I'm just nervous. He said, nervous. And, and, and it, it, I say that I applies to my, it applied to my life. Why would I, you know, when I used to wrestle every day of my life, when and people thought the matches were good or great or whatever they were, right? I drank all night. And still had a match and never thought about it. All of a sudden, as you feel like everybody's looking at you, right. I felt scrutinized. And I was walking around, you know, two glasses of wine. I mean, I was miserable. Everybody else was drinking. You know, Nestler was there. And, um, Wade Boggs. And it was just a great time. And Michael Hayes said, what the hell are you doing? You can retire tomorrow. You're wrestling Shawn Michaels. And I said, you know what? You're right. And I got hammered. And we had to, <laughs> we had to have a match the next day. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you, it's still one of the greatest matches I can recall at WrestleMania. Just uh, as, as a pure match, uh, knowing the night before, you have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And then having this match, it's uh, uh, lose, go home. Yeah, well, here's the deal. And I had Shawn Michaels, you know, and the guy carried me for 30 minutes. I mean, I just did. I never had anybody in my entire career look at me and say, keep your mouth shut. Let's go out here and do this. Don't say a word. And that's when and we then, walked and, to the curtain. And then the perfect shot to the camera, looking at you, mm. getting ready to make the move. And Shawn Michaels says, I love you. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Oh, man, that was touching. I mean, I'll put my retirement up with anybody in any sport, anywhere. I mean, it's just that, that evening, the night before, when Kevin Dunn, you know, told me to go out and talk all night long, so I did. <laughs> and they wrapped me up for 45 minutes, and I didn't know what they meant. <laughs> but then you were only halfway through the list of names. Yeah, Kev, Kevin said, go out there and have fun. Okay. <laughs> I thought that meant I could talk till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So, no, you know, you know what you you've had an extraordinary run. Oh my God! And 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 Rick, you know you really worked on top your entire career. Mm -hmm. And that 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 is something that not a whole lot of people have done, including Hulk Hogan, including The Rock, including Steve Austin, Mick yeah. Foley. I mean, you 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 jettisoned to the top very quickly down in that. Uh, that Carolina territory with the uh, Crockett organization. Yeah, Somebody well, saw something they liked. Well, that's all thanks to our good buddy, and he's been gone for a long time now. But, I mean, I can't say enough about Wahoo McDaniels to people. You know, and it's that's I struggle with changing the subject for a second. Why he's not in the Hall of Fame, but that's another issue. <laughs> oh, he will be. He will be, but, I mean, the guy was such an influence on my career, as was Dusty and... I mean, I break, here's Ric Flair. I break in with Dusty Rhodes, Dick Murdoch, Ray Stevens, Nick Bockwinkel, Larry Henning, Harley Race. 
Um, I mean, with Dusty, I was so enamored with Dusty that when I wasn't working, I would go on the road with those guys and come home with no money. They wonder why I'm divorced the first time, right? <laughs> no, nobody goes to Mitchell, South Dakota, the Corn Palace, just to drive the guys in a snowstorm. You know, I just I did. I mean, it was ridiculous. You know, the time that Dusty called me and says, hey, listen, don't tell anybody we need a ride to the airport. We're going to be on Johnny Carson Tonight Show, right? I go, oh, God, that's cool. He said, don't tell anybody. Don't let Vern know. Don't let anybody know. So I drive him to the airport, right, and I go home. I don't tell anybody. I don't even tell Leslie, right? I'm like, Kay Faven, right? And uh, so I'm sitting there watching Johnny Carson. I wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. wait, 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 wait uh, still, I'm still sitting there waiting for Dusty and Murdoch <laughs> and Johnny Carson. <laughs> they flew to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dust. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I felt for anything he told me, I believed. He called me one time and said, get over to the apartment. He said, Kay Noble's going to be on you like lightning on a June bug. Where <laughs> 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 he came up with that stuff, I have no idea. The girl wrestlers of that era were a little different, too. Would you not agree, Gene? Oh, I, I would, but I'll tell you what, uh, Wahoo especially, I had, uh, I, I always liked Wahoo. He's a likable guy. Oh, God, he's, uh, a, he's a man's they, man. They, yeah, they brought him up to Minnesota, and everybody said, this guy's not going to work out. He's good. Winter will come. He'll be out of here in a flash. You know what happened up there, Rick? Wahoo found ice fishing, and he was just enamored with it. And his three or four days a week that he had off, that's what he did. Ray Stevens did the same thing up in Minnesota. Of course. They, they, uh, they either were hunter fishermen, and Wahoo just loved that ice fishing. God, you, I, I was born and raised there. You couldn't get me out on a... A lake and uh, 25 below zero? Yeah, me either, Gene. No, I'd yeah. just soon go to Bonefish Grill. Yeah, well, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> That's good. No, what's funny, though, is uh, with Ray, it wasn't the ice fishing. He, he bought himself a snowmobile that would go 140 miles an hour. Yeah, the exactly. Polaris. You know, anything and when, he, that... when he met me, we were pheasant hunting <laughs> with uh, Larry Hennig, and I came out in my car. I just bought a brand-new Cadillac. <laughs> And uh, this, what I'd say, was probably about 1973, 4 or 5 in there somewhere. And I drove the Cadillac right down the cornrows. And Ray Stevens says, by God, if I I can do that, I like him. So I was accepted into the fold as a hunter. <laughs> yeah, he was, the, I mean, unless you knew Ray Stevens and unless you knew Harley in the heyday, it's hard to explain to people <laughs> about them. If it, if, it, if it would go fast, they had to have it. Mm-hmm. If, if there was oh, yeah. A, if there was a disturbance. And, 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 the... and, and, uh, and they certainly proved that uh, through the years. Yeah. I mean, Harley uh, Harley was an accident after accident. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he got uh, hurt more outside of the ring than he did inside. <laughs> would yeah. you not agree? Yeah, I mean, that time I got that call was 87 or something like that. Or Let me see, I was in that house. I got When he hit the brick wall? He, uh, well, he hit, it was a, a, a piling on the freeway holding up a bridge, right? Well, it could have been. I... Yeah, something like that. But he hit it going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> he lived. Yeah, but, I hope that wasn't intentional. Well, we never knew. You know, it happened right after the, the boat accident. You know about that, right? Right. And, you know, nobody knew. I mean, I, I'm not, I couldn't imagine Harley not, you know, it was during the daytime. It wasn't drinking or anything. So I don't know what. Nobody knew. But, I mean, you, you would hope that wasn't the case. The case but No. Uh, I'll tell you what, though. He was, he was a great, great wrestler, great oh. star, and a hard worker, the greatest talent on God's green earth. Yes. <laughs> That's his line. Hey, um, you know what? And in, in, in his eyes, and I tell a lot of people this too, he was the world champion. <laughs> he thought he was. And he had no problems explaining that to anybody. Instead of just enjoying himself at the bar and having a drink, he wanted to drink the beer the fastest. He wanted to have the most shots. And he wanted to punch somebody. That was just the way it was. He was the world champion. Yeah. And, he and, not- and when he and Larry were tag oh. team uh, uh, partners up in Minneapolis, they cleaned out every joint on Hennepin Avenue. 
The they, uh, flame. <laughs> they, they, they knew how to raise hell. Yeah, the flame. <laughs> the <Jeez>. flame. <laughs> It's, now, it's with, now a Japanese parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go to school. Woo! Nation will return shortly. Introducing Play.it, a podcast network like no other. From award-winning news programming and number one sports brands to entertainment and business leaders, Play.it is delivering storytelling at its best. We're going to be having conversations with newsmakers and culture shapers. I will be talking mostly about fashion and how I've been marketing all my life. Tech, culture, and entrepreneurship. Everything in the world of sports entertainment and wrestling and beyond. Hear what you've been missing at Play.it. With Ric Flair. Oh, when that, you, know, you remember when Dusty and Murdoch had that mule, right? Zeb. Zeb, yeah, and they took yeah. they, they rode that mule into the uh, flame, that country western bar, I swear right. to God. Yeah, I, you probably couldn't get away with that now. <laughs> no, it, uh, I think they've got laws against that. But uh, they also had to have a place to... Uh, the store, this this uh, this horse at night. <laughs> they they didn't the have a stable. The they didn't have a barn, so they brought him into Cedar Zedina in their apartment. <laughs> I know. And a cockamamie mule would uh, lay down on the living room floor, and those guys would drink and party around him and go to bed. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't tell Leslie where I was. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't. She <laughs> yeah. wouldn't believe you. Well, in my life, I was doing good till they invent the cell phone. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you, you take a look at uh, at where the business is today, and uh, it it is. I mean, with the with the music, the original music that Jim Johnson up in Stanford, Connecticut, is a genius. But uh, there's just so much going on that. Uh, I'm just happy to be around it and be able to see it. But, of course, we're seeing more wrestling on television than we ever have in our entire lives. Oh, I know. I know. Gene, what do you, what's your take? Why, you know, when we're up, you know, I get it when we're getting NFL and that. But uh, if I'm, unless I'm hearing things wrong, the ratings have been down the last couple of weeks. And I thought the shows have been pretty good. What do you think? It just... Are we oversaturated? Well, they're, they're, they're cyclical, and uh, it also depends on competition. Yeah. You know, NFL has got the Monday night games in the in the fall and early winter, so uh, sometimes we're off a, a hash mark or two. Yeah, yeah, no, but, uh, I know. Well, I'm talking about, like, right now, we're, it's, unless they're playing against LeBron James, uh, I'm not going to watch. I mean, I'm going to watch WWE. If LeBron's playing, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm going to watch LeBron. But the rest of the NBA, they can have. You know, I mean, you know, he's the Michael Jordan of of, of this era, and I I love watching him. But well, yeah. I I bounce back and forth. I just make sure that the Cavs are in the lead. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, what I, what I try to do. Uh, those ratings sometimes, you know, we watch them too close, and if they aren't exactly what what somebody is looking for, then we're going to make a big change. Yeah, and exactly. I think because of that, our storylines are so accelerated today yeah. and go so fast that it's not like you can sink your teeth into a good angle. I think you and I ought to get on a joint call to Vince and recommend that once a month we do the crossover at 10 o'clock, just you and me. We'll do the laundry. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll promote the hotel bar since the guy's so popular now. We'll do something. To create some like electricity in that community. Well, if that's what needs to be done to get the numbers, <laughs> I'll sacrifice. Oh, I'll guarantee you. Let me get yeah. the handcuffs. Let me get some handcuffs. We'll do the whole gig again. <laughs> Rick, another thing that I I remember from your career <laughs> is uh, that you know not only you and all of the guys that you worked with. I mean, Sting, but Ricky Steamboat. Yeah. Now, Ricky Steamboat was another guy. That trained under Vern. Yep. And I'm sure it was right about the same era as you. Well, two years behind me. Oh, he was. Yeah, two years He'd behind be 74 me. 74 then. The class behind me was Slaughter, and I don't know who else was with him. Uh, Chris Taylor was with Bob. Um, 
uh, with the Sarge. And then uh, I think Steamboat came a year later because he came to Charlotte in 76. Yeah, that, Steamboat was there in 74. 74, yeah. That was the first time that he removed my laundry to get a house in Greenville Monday night. <laughs> it worked good. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, 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 I mean, he turned out to be a, oh my a God. spectacular talent, but, but he, he did it on his own creatively. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall, Bruce Lee was the, the hot ticket yes. back in, in, in that time period. Mm -hmm. And he, he had that, uh, he, he I think, I think he's half uh, Asian or, or Hawaiian. He's half he, Asian and, uh, uh, just, just half Asian, but he looks Hawaiian. Yeah. And they but, said he was uh, Sam Steamboat's uh, nephew or something, or something like that. Right. He, he was, but I mean, he was right on uh, with with that uh, with that concept. And the one thing about it, it didn't age, and neither did Ricky Steamboat. No, God. And Gene, he had he had, you know, he was one of the two or three best physiques in the business. Him and Kerry Good Von looking. Eric and Luger. I mean, he looked incredible. But he, there's only one guy I've ever been in the ring with. That's anywhere. Well, I, he, they're the same. I can't, I can't decipher between the two. But Steamboat and, and Shawn Michaels were in a class of the, all by themselves. I mean, this many years later, Steamboat was still that good. Yeah, yeah. Well, matter of fact, I, I saw him a few years ago. I think down in Phoenix, uh, he got into the ring, and wow, he must have been pretty close to sixty. I'm no, thinking. no, that was in that was in Houston. That was with Mickey Rorick. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, I was right. in Houston. I was part of that hey, fiasco too, man. <laughs> yep. We're reminiscing with Mean Gene Okerlund here on Woo Nation, exclusively from Play.it. Getting ready to kind of wind her down here, Gene. A couple last few questions here. Back in 98, there was a lot of heat between Eric Bischoff and Rick that kept Rick out of the company for a while. And at the time, there were reports that Bischoff would hold meetings for the company and in those meetings, just kind of bury Rick. Can you confirm those meetings were true? And what were you thinking as he's saying all this about your friend, Rick Flair? Well, I, I know for a fact that, uh, that he did, and there was obviously not a lot of love lost between the two, either then or today. Uh, even though I, I do see Eric periodically, I think he's changed a little bit. He's off his high horse, but uh, he, he, he was really in a tough spot down there because he didn't have a clue where the men's room was. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 he's, and he's writing uh, contracts for, for talent <laughs> that, that had creative control of their characters. Please. <laughs> But but you know what? I forgive Eric for everything, and uh, uh, no no ill feelings between he and I at this yeah. juncture. But you know that's my my take on it, Gene. I look, I look at here's the deal. Um, I look at where I've been and what I've been through and up and down. And at the end of the day, I haven't got much to bitch about. You know what I mean? And I, you know, it's funny because as these as we get older. I look forward when I know Gene Oakland somewhere that I'm going right. to be, and uh, like we were in San Diego, we had a great time. He and I and Wendy, and uh, you know, Wendy, w Wendy, <laughs> Wendy has taken over much like the friendship with you. Wendy's taken over the relationship with me and Gene. <laughs> she talked to Gene on a regular basis. She says Gene loved my character Fifi. He helped develop it. <laughs> course, <laughs> okay, course, Wendy, calm and down. It was in San Diego, Rick. I believe yeah. it was San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We were in San Diego together, too. At it's the casino. casino. Well, if you, if you want to count all of them, we've been everywhere. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I make the mistake of giving Wendy somebody's number, and she just stays in touch, man. It's like she, my friend Conrad, they have become best friends. I, I don't talk to them sometimes <laughs> for a week at a time. I Conrad, communicate to, with Wendy. Uh, the, in summation on your, uh, on your comment about the, the, uh, the feeling between Rick and Eric, uh, in 1998, and I know that uh, he he told you go home, you're going to get paid, but uh, I, don't, I don't want you here. And uh, that's kind of cold because you love the business so damn much. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that by that time it was uh, it was a loose cannon, and the whole thing was making the nosedive down. And it was just a matter of time before they uh, they set her up. 
When did you door. know that the writing was on the wall and that WCW was going to close? Do you remember the moment where you thought, this is done? Well, I had just signed a new three-year contract with Turner Sports in February, and they shut her down in March, so I wasn't worried too much for the next three or four years. Right. Yeah, I had I had a year and a half left on my deal, too. And Goldberg, who knows what he had. Yeah, God, he got rich. But you know what? You, you can't fault him. I mean, you know, I'm 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 happy that Bill got it. You know, everybody yeah. else. You, you you can't fault the Nash and uh, and Hall. No, you can't, you fault, can't fault, 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 fault anybody. I mean, you fault know, Hulk. they they gave everybody money except me. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. I love it, and I'm just you know I'm talking to you at the end of the day, and they're not. So well, you know what? You've been a big part of my life, Rick, and uh, you and uh, it's going to be that way. Uh, even after we go upstairs, I'm sure they got a saloon up there that we no, can I'm kick sure. back and have a Martin. My mom and dad are going to be at the bar tonight up there listening to this. <laughs> and you know what? They're going to be joined by Vern Gagne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my mom and, and dad are this one. I can he'll assure have a drink you. Or two. <laughs> yeah, and you know. Um, uh, the thing about uh, life right now is that I'm in a good place, Gene, and I'm glad I could call you and have you come on the show. I want you to know how much I respect you and how much I think of you, and so proud to call you my friend. Well, that, that feeling is mutual, Rick, and it always will be. Uh, there have been instances where we might have had some creative differences, but you know what? We always work those out and put on one hell of a show. I don't think we've ever had a creative difference. I'd have to think about that one. <laughs> well, maybe that heart attack in the corner of the ring. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but I was told not to tell anybody. <laughs> right. Well, you got David Crockett down there <laughs> with, a, with the gurney. <laughs> yeah, and that was so creative the, uh, with those EMTs guys. He's there with the uh, stethoscopes and, <laughs> I know. and a kid. Well, kid they told me the to have to show him I can act. Old. His <laughs> eyes were as big as, uh, as saucers. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good memory. He said, I love "Holy you. balls!" Yeah, that was the that was the that was the creative team from Atlanta coming to Tampa. Dan Reeves, the coach of the Falcons, that had a heart attack on the sidelines that day, right? Right. So on the way to Atlanta, on the way to Tampa, they said, "Let's have Flair have a heart attack on the show." The tail goes. That's how creative they were. <laughs> Uh, you, you you had a lot of believers that night. <laughs> I know. I heard about it. Yeah. Well, I love you, man. I, I love you too, Rick. And uh, Conrad, thanks uh, for your time. And uh, who knows? Maybe we get a chance to do this again. But I, I hope forward so. forward to seeing you in the near future. Gene, thank you so much. And let me tell you, I will definitely be at the country club uh, at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock? Yep. I'm going to have to change my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you there. Bye, Gene. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right, we're back on Woo Nation here from Play.it. Our third one's in the can. Mean Gene was a hell of a guest. You had a great call there, buddy. Yeah, thank you. He's a wonderful guy. And um, sometimes you just look at life and say, my God, you have these kind of friends and you can reach out to them. And uh, it, this isn't working. This is just having a good time. Yeah. And, and talking to good friends and, you know, sharing old memories and you know, 90% of their memories are good. That's how I look at it. And every memory I have of him is phenomenal. And, and we really just scratched the surface with Gene. Gene's been everywhere, from the AWA to WWF yep. to WCW. And we've got so many cool stories that we could have touched on there, but we just ran out of time before you knew it. You know, we'd been on the phone 45 minutes. So yeah. well, I we'll hope do we it again. have him back. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great, great we, guest. We need to, with Gene, we call him. We need to go down to the local bar down here and call Gene at 5 <laughs> o'clock at the country club and... <laughs> We'll crank up the podcast to another rating level. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when Stone Cold does that, he calls it Austin Unleashed. Yeah. So we would have to call. <laughs> well, they, we'll get creative here. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, you're listening to Woo Nation right here on Play.it. Thanks for listening. Woo!
Love listening to your favorite podcasts on Play.it? Sign up today for the Play.it newsletter to receive monthly updates on new podcasts, notable guests, trending shows, and more. Sign up now at PlayItNewsletter.com. That's PlayItNewsletter.com. Hear what you've been missing.